All right, grab your Bibles with me tonight. We'll go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, last week we kicked off kind of a mini series uh, just talking about some of the different uh, roles in the church, and tonight we'll be speaking to one as well. 1 Timothy. Chapter number three, we looked at the church member last week, just kind of uh, what the church member is, what their uh, uh, kind of job is in the church, uh, something um, that is very important to the church is the church members. We're all church members, amen? Uh, I actually became the youth pastor before I was a church member. I forgot about that until this moment. We were youth pastoring here for a couple weeks, and then pastor looked at me and said, did you ever join the church? I said, no, sir. And he said, you should probably do that. And that that was good fun. Uh, But yes, so we're going to look at the deacon tonight, the role of the deacon. And um, there is so much that goes into these topics. Please don't view this as a final, uh, you know, all in. This is exactly what it is. There is so much uh, that we can truly uh, glean from Scripture and dive into, but this will be an overview for the role of the deacon. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Let's look at verse number eight, starting in verse eight, 1 Timothy 3 and verse number eight. It says, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy liqueur, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them uh, use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Let's pray and then we'll get into the study tonight. Lord, just again, thank you for allowing us to meet together. Lord, I pray for those who are out with sickness. Uh, Lord, a lot of that uh, beginning to pop up. Tis the season of allergies and, and those type of things. Lord, I pray you continue to watch over our church, watch over the teachers, watch over the leaders. Lord, watch over every aspect of this ministry that we can present your work, a glorious church, Lord, a a fitly framed together, a striving together body of believers, Lord, as we approach days like this Sunday, Lord, as we reach uh, into the community and desire just to be able to shed some love, but more importantly, to share the gospel, Lord, to tell them how you came to this earth, you died for them, Lord, specifically because you loved them, Lord, and I pray that our church is able to show that love, but be with our study now. Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, I I pray that you direct my thoughts. Lord, that um, you just uh, get rid of my own ideas. Lord, help it to all be from Bible. Lord, I I pray that uh, we don't approach this topic lightly. Uh, Lord, as it's an office in the church, and we thank you uh, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, um, this is a overview of the role of a deacon and you know, it's been said and I tend to uh, believe the, the, this statement that having good deacons can either half your ministry, meaning they can tear it down, they can um, minimize it, they can cut it down to what uh, uh, it potentially could be or having good deacons could double your ministry as a church, right? So it's a very important role in the church, understanding though uh, it does not uh, um, come without its precautions, right? We have to be mindful as we look at the role of a deacon and the position of the church can truly be accelerated in ministry because of the deacons, Right? They're, they are established, they were established on purpose for a reason. Right? I, I mentioned the office of the deacon, and I truly believe it is an office of the church, two offices. I hold firm to that belief, and some people might ask the question, why is it an office? Why, why is it this established thing in the church? Because really, if you think about it, there is not a lot at all mentioned in scripture about deacons. There's just really not. Philippians 1, uh, um, verse number one, deacons are referenced very briefly. 
Paul is writing to the church. He says to the elders and deacons. That's all. Okay, we, we see in 1 Timothy, uh, it is um, given to us the requirements, right? What a deacon is to be. And we just read through those. But other than those two portions, and then also in Acts number six, even though technically in Acts number six, the word deacon is never used, right? But it's always been assumed that by the church, I hold, I believe that it is the role of a deacon in Acts 6, and we'll look at that in a little while. But really, that's all that's spoken of in Scripture about this position. And as a Baptist church, truly what we will say is an office in the church, right? A position of importance, Right, so why is it an office? And I do think that it's important. And we'll go ahead and look at just a few pages back to Philippians in your Bible, Philippians 1. And I just mentioned this verse, but Paul says in verse 1, Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are at Philippi with the bishops, right, and deacons. So it is obviously something, and um, many times the word deacon is broken down into a, a, um, a heartfelt, you know, that servanthood. Somebody was truly a, a heart-led servant. Somebody really has a heart for the ministry, that type of servant. But it doesn't really make sense in the context there of Philippians, because why would Paul specify to the, the pastors, to the bishops, and also every heart-led servant in the church. Okay, no, it's he's he's referring and I strongly believe that is a specific position and then also where we read in 1 Timothy 3 verse 8, this is a role. This is the requirements, responsibility. This is what a deacon should be. So those two portions of scripture specifically using deacon Okay, but then also referring to, listen, it, it is uh, the, the pastors, the bishops, and the deacons. And now, 1 Timothy 3, we go through the first part of the chapter, in, uh, chapter number 3 of 1 Timothy, speaking to what a pastor is, right? The responsibilities, uh, the requirements of a pastor, but then it falls to immediately after the responsibilities, the requirements of a deacon. So that is why I hold to this is a position, it is an office in the church. But like I said, it, it is very sparse. I mean, there's not a whole lot in scripture, but we should look at this and we should always approach it with a lot of grace, right? There are a lot of opinions about deacons in a lot of different churches, Right? There's a lot of assumptions about deacons in a lot of churches, what they should be, what they're supposed to be. This is how they're supposed to behave. This is the things that they're supposed to do, but we have to approach it. Like I said, anytime you're talking about the role of deacon, have a lot of grace, have a lot of big heartedness, right? And, and just approach it, understanding that people land in a lot of different areas because there's not a lot to go off of, okay? But we're looking at this based on what I can see in scripture, what I've studied, and we're gonna get into this uh, and understand, be careful because churches can fall uh, really around deacons into traditions, right? They, they can fall uh, into two really dangerous categories when you're looking at deacons because they can build them up right? The, the position of a deacon can be elevated so greatly in a church that they are basically uh, this uh, a de facto pastor, right? They're, they're right there with the pastor. This is, this is what their job is. This is what their role is. And that's a very dangerous place for a church to hold the position of a deacon. But then also on the flip side, Sometimes churches just assume and they fall into this category of a, a putting a deacon into this lower position. They're basically a glorified groundskeeper. They're a glorified janitor, right? So we definitely have to be careful of both of those things uh, because of what they can present to a church. You know, looking at Philippians 1 there and then looking at 1 Timothy 3 here, like I mentioned, the pastors being referenced first, 
and the deacons being referenced second, I hold that the pastor is still uh, uh, the under shepherd, right? The, the leader in the church to where the deacon's job is to be the servant of the servant, right? The pastor is the first servant to the church. His responsibility is to serve the church, teach the church, preach the word to the church. The deacon's now to be the servant to the pastor servant coming under and taking on what he uh, struggles with, what he is uh, um, needing help with. And that's where Acts chapter number six comes in. And turn with me there, if you would, Acts chapter number six. We'll read through a little bit of this and then we'll look a little bit more at the role and the responsibilities of this position in the church. Acts chapter number six. And it says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Right, so here we're taking place, right? Uh, Pentecost had happened. The church is now booming, right? They went from 3,000 in a short time span. Another 2,000 joined the church. This church basically overnight, right, jumped from very few to 5,000 individuals. Okay, so all of a sudden in those days, right, the number of disciples in the church, right, Christ followers, it was multiplied, and there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Listen, our widows aren't getting taken care of as good as your widows are, right? Me being uh, the Grecian, the, the Greek individual, hey, how come, right, you as the Hebrew, right, as the Jewish people, your widows are getting better taken care of and all of this kind of infighting had the potential of erupting. Verse number two, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables, right? Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But when but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and <laughs> Procurus, and Nicnor, and Timnon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, and Prolocyte, and Anti of Antioch. Okay, so here the seven men were called out from the church. Everybody was pleased with the decision, and it was for a specific purpose, right? The, the, the preachers, we could say, these individuals, they get to a point and they say, listen, it's not good, right? It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables, Right? It, it's becoming difficult for us to put the appropriate time into study, to put the appropriate time into prayer for the people of the church because we're always running around. Hey, do you need anything else? Can I get you anything else? What else can I do for you? Here's another meatloaf, okay, so to speak. Hey, what else can I do? So they picked individuals. right? And this speaks to what I believe. Like I said, nowhere in there does it say, Call out your deacons. Okay, it doesn't say that. Call ye out seven deacons. But it just says, call out from among you, right? Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, right? Those individuals. But looking at 1 Timothy, we can see from what the requirements are that that really lines up with what a deacon is in the church Okay, so what is the role then of the deacon? You know, it's an interesting story I heard while looking at this topic, and there was a story of the Nazis, and they did not like deacons, right? And you say, what in the world? And this is true, right? So Nazi Germany did not like deacons. In 1940, when the Netherlands fell to Germany, the deacons of the Dutch Reformed Church rose up and stood to care for the political repressed. 
right? They, they took upon them. They said, these people are hurting as part of our church body. The Nazis are coming in. We have a responsibility. So the deacons and the church gave them food and gave secret refuge. The Nazis heard about it and they uh, decreed that the office of deacon should be eliminated, Right, true story. The Nazis of Germany, right, Germany coming in into this Dutch Reformed church. They like, we are making a decree that we are getting rid of church deacons. That's how impactful good church deacons could actually be in a church. So they wanted to eliminate this position of deacon. And the Dutch believers responded in the Synod of 1941 and what said that if you attack the deacons, right, or the position that they hold, it's attacking the church. If you lay hands on a deacon, you're laying hands on the very worship of God. And the Nazis, they, they actually backed down, right? So, I mean, it's a huge thing. Good deacons play a huge impact on the surrounding community, right? On the individuals in church. It's crazy that when I was, uh, like I said, studying this, I came across that story. I was like, what in the world are they talking about? Nazis don't like deacons. Well, that's because deacons were like, uh-uh, okay? That's crazy to me. But the role of the deacons as, as they're coming in, and, and we could kind of see in Acts 6 as we looked at that, there'd be this model servant, right? This individual in the church, and they're just firing on all cylinders as to this is the role. This is how we're supposed to behave ourselves as Christians. This is how we're supposed to act as Christians, how we're supposed to respond in situations as Christians, right? This model servant who was at one point recognized by the congregation, and then they were installed into this position of office in order to aid the pastor, Right? We could say by doing a, a spotting and meeting tangible needs. Right? It's, not, it's not reasonable that we should be pulling ourselves away from the word and prayer to serve tables, they said in Acts. Right? So there was a tangible need as to why these individuals were called out from the congregation. Right? They, they aid the pastor by protecting and promoting church unity. Right? That is why they're there, to help uh, uh, mend the issues of the congregation. The Grecians were at the Hebrews because my widows aren't as important as your widows. So they come and they address the issue to keep the unity of the church. And what they're doing also by aiding the pastor is helping facilitate the ministry of the word of God. Right? So what is a deacon's role? It is to come in help with tangible needs, protect and promote the unity of the church, and help facilitate the preaching and study of God's word, right? That is the primary responsibility of what a deacon should be. There's many different opinions about whether deacon boards are good, deacon boards are bad, like I said, the idea and the topic of deacon falls in many different places in church circles, Many different places, probably even in our church circle, right? Many people have opinions from this is how it's always been to this is how granddad did it. This is how the church was established. This is how we were taught. We have to be careful though, because if it's detracting or ever pulling away from, they're to be promoting and meeting the tangible needs of the church, protecting and promoting the church unity and helping facilitate the ministry of the word. That is when they begin to be the problematic side of deacons. Okay, so looking at that role and what they play, we have to look at the responsibility and really the requirement of the office, right? If they're to play this hugely impactful role in the church, Right, as a deacon, right, and it's important for the church to understand this position, right? It's not my favorite type of preaching, okay? But we're looking at what a primarily office in uh, uh, the Baptist church is, how we look at this, 
And in order for them to fulfill this role of aiding the pastor, uh, of being a help to the church, the requirements of the office are truly important. First Timothy 3 and verse number eight, right? Likewise, right? Just as, listen, as the office of pastor has a important role, right? This bishop in the church has an important role and requirements. Likewise, must the deacons, Right? Verse number eight of chapter three. What's he saying? Timothy, you have to set the right kind of leadership into the church. You got to put the right type of people. The who in the, in the what's of, of a deacon should be, right? They likewise, the deacons must be grave, right? They got to be grave. This is somebody who's, who's dignified, who, who is a, a, an honorable person, so somebody that the church recognizes as such. This individual is an important member of the congregation to where they are known for maybe their spiritual base, right? Their, their spiritual attitude, their demeanor, their wisdom. They're very dignified in the church. They're an honorable individual in the church, right? Likewise, they must be great, not double-tongued. Right, this is a very important thing for any type of leadership because you begin to fall into this category, right, of church destroying atmospheres, church destroying demeanors, not double tongued. They're not a hypocrite, right? Somebody who's not saying something to this side of the church, yeah, we're going to take care of your widows. Oh, don't worry, your widows come first. No, but your widows, don't worry, you'll get dessert first. Nope, you're going to get the most, right? And they're going back and forth. I'm using that example. But really, it falls to such a greater thing. If you're telling certain individuals information as a deacon, right? But then you're telling the pastor and the church leadership something, it begins to uh, become an issue of tension and problems in the church, not double-tongued. A church does not want a deacon who's going to be lying to them, right? And, and that's very important, we continue on, not, someone who is grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, right? What, what is he getting at here? Somebody who's not controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit, right? So somebody who is uh, um, willing to, obviously, uh, not to substances, right? Obviously, not to things like liquor and that sort, but also it goes so much further just to everyday life. You are not controlled by your own emotions. You're not controlled by your own desires. You are somebody who is not given over to things, right? It's so important. You, we have to, as a church body, when we establish our deacons, we have a great group of deacons in our church. Don't, don't ever misunderstand uh, that because I'm teaching on this, but we need individuals who are not controlled by anything other than God, right? The spirit of the Lord. Continuing on, not double tongue, not given to much wine, not greedy, uh, filthy lucre, right? Serving God for the sake of serving, right? For the, for the sake of the Lord. That is the only reason that somebody should desire this office. It, it's, I'm not looking for title. I'm not looking for position. I'm not looking for uh, attention, right? But really what I'm doing this, I'm doing it for God, right? I, I have decided I want to serve God the best way possible. This is how I can do that, serving God for the sake of the Lord, not for uh, position or status, not for uh, financial gain, right? Or, or uh, some level of importance, right? They're, they're not to be desirous uh, of the, the valued information, not, not, not going uh, uh, to profit in this position in any way, whether that be financial, whether that be uh, um, with the information. Some people enjoy having information that other people don't have. Some people enjoy uh, uh, getting paid for positions and that's the only reason they do things. So some people fall into these dangerous areas and we got to be mindful of that, right? Because in this position, right, they have to be desirous only of truly growing in their closeness to the Lord, right? Being able to help the church as they grow closer to God, Right? They grow closer to the church body because that's how people know we're Christians when we love one another. Okay, that's huge. 
not given to greedy liqueur, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, right? Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. They must be spiritual individuals, right? Not new to the faith. These are well-grounded men in the church, right? There there are these uh, people who have been around and everybody just knows, man, this guy knows a thing or two, right? About the Bible, about scripture. He's spirit led. He's been spirit fed, right? He's spirit uh, uh, nutrient rich, okay? He's just always desirous of growing and, and receiving and getting closer to God, right? Holding the mystery of faith and a pure conscience. They must be spiritual people, not new to the faith. They gotta have that track record of spiritual growth behind them, right? This is an individual you can clearly tell is maturing in the faith, growing closer to God, doing what he's supposed to be doing. That is what a deacon should be. Somebody who is pure, right? The faith that they possess has to match the life that they're living, right? I am, I am projecting this type of faith in my life, right? This level of spirituality while I'm at church, Make sure it's the same at home, right? It's good for any Christian, but it's specifically pointed out for the role in the office of deacon. It's important for them and us as a church body, right? Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Let these also first be proved, right? Let them be proved. What does that mean, right? Just like anyone, uh, Coming into ministry, right? We are uh, um, looking for a youth pastor currently. We have uh, um, been uh, making some reference calls for a youth pastor who had reached out to me and and we're checking and we're proving them, right? We want to make sure that they are of like mind, like faith, right? Like practice in Christianity. We want to make sure those things are established, especially for leadership, and that falls to the deacon, We got to prove these individuals, right? Test them. They're not a novice in their faithfulness, their spirituality, but they're not a novice in serving in church, right? You don't just want to put a deacon in there and be like, you know, he comes to church a lot, but he never does anything, right? He never shows up to events, right? He doesn't reach out to people, but he's smiling and he says hi to people. Hey, that's a good thing but probably not the best for that role, for that office. Why? Because he hasn't been proved in service to God, right? We have to be able to prove them first before establishing them. It's very important. And then verse number 10, it says, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless, right? Not given to sin, Right, not given to sin, not having an attitude or a behavior that is lending itself to a sinful lifestyle. Right, you would say, this just, it's common sense, Pastor Dan, I know, but we're going through it. Right, it is important. Right, you would never want a leader in the church given over to sin. Right, even more so the appearance of it. Right? Hey, we're, we're to be mindful of how we appear to individuals. Right? I, I am very cautious. Now, I've always been cautious, especially in the youth pastor position, uh, because at times there is a possibility of you being alone with a female type person. Right? It just, it just comes up anytime in ministry. It's just something. And Many of you know that I've said it. If you are broke down on the side of the road as a single female, I will stop. I will help the best I can. If you need to go somewhere, you can take my car or I will wait with you. But I will not go with you in my car. Personal conviction. Why? Because that could appear wrong. Right? That could appear. Somebody driving by who doesn't know the situation be like, Pastor Dan was just driving down the road with such and such. Right? And then all of a sudden it's blown out of proportion and now I'm guilty of all of these things, but all I was really doing was changing the tire. Okay? We have to be mindful of those things. And as a deacon, they're to be mindful of those things also. Right? That's something I'm very cautious of. 
right? As a youth pastor, even as a pastor, if a female would show up, right? And I'm here by myself, I always message Steve, my wife, and usually Christy. And I'll say, there's a lady here. I'm either locking myself in the office, right? Turning off those front sets of lights, shutting both of those doors locked and hiding under my desk. No, I don't. But I'm locked in my office through people know, or I leave, right? Or I leave. We used to have a young uh, lady from the teen group babysit our kids during the summer months. And it was Micah and Christy's three. So there was a group of them, right? So there were five uh, of these individuals here. And you say, well, there were five of them. Yeah, but they're kids, right? And so when this young lady, if she was ever here with the kids and Christy had to run and make an errand for me and Steve was on an errand for me and it was just me, I'd be like, I'm leaving. Okay, I'm going to the gas station or I would even go to the teen building and lock myself in the teen building. Okay, why? Because it's very important and deacons should have that same mindset because they must be blameless, found blameless. I don't ever want somebody to have the ability to be like, you did this because I saw you with, and it happens. It happens, okay? But that's why we're to be cautious and why these uh, really, <laughs> what, what we're supposed to do, the requirements are listed here. Verse number 11, deacons have uh, this kind of added on here. And it's interesting to me that there's nowhere uh, in scripture where it says a pastor's wife must be, okay? But it gets to a point where it says their wives must be, right? Right after the deacons. I believe this incorporates both of them, okay? But I do like to point out, hey, right after the deacons, it says a deacon's wife has to be this, Okay, but it's important for any ministry office position, pastor or deacon, that they understand even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things, right? It's important. Even the wives must be into this category because if they're not, then the men are not qualified. That's amazing to me as how much and how important the role of marriage truly is to God because it goes to the offices of the church. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their house as well. Verse 12, right? So being uh, this uh, husband of one wife, um, I don't believe it's to the same degree as what a pastor is in that situation. Uh, I don't believe that Paul is saying that a deacon has to be married. Okay, um, I, I just don't believe that because it kind of goes back to what he tells the church at Corinth uh, about it's better for them to be single, but it's still good to uh, want all of these blessings and all of these positions. Okay, but um, we'll talk about pastors next week as we look at that, but I don't believe that's talking about that. But if they are married, right, they're not to be a polygamous right? They're, they're not to be somebody with multiple wives, okay? They're, they're, they're not to be uh, uh, somebody who is divorced and, and desiring to serve in that position. So we have to be mindful of that as the role of deacons ruling their children and their house as well, okay? In that position, in that role as deacon, even as the role of pastor, right? Like I said, we'll discuss that more next week, but the deacons of the same sense, if your uh, home is in disarray, how can you be expected to help the church, right? If, if you got all these crazy thoughts at home, if you got all these crazy things at home, you have to be cautious as to how it affects the church as a whole, right? Um, Acts chapter number six, when we were looking at it, like I said, that, that topic, that, that name deacon never truly shows up. But the, the, the way that it relates to 1 Timothy 3 here and, and how those men are biblical, spiritual men who were called out from the church. They were put into a position to help the pastors, the, the teachers of the word of God to aid in doing those things, right? We have to understand deacons are there to come alongside and support. They are the ultimate support group of the church, 
right? They, they are the individuals who are to be uh, humble servants, right? Caring for the needs of the church members, uh, some sense of pastoral care. Uh, oftentimes they fall into pastoral counsel, uh, point of contact between the church and the pastor or pastors, right? And it can't just be anybody who can be in this position, and ultimately, everything that falls down here, we want, as a church, we want to always be following the scripture, looking to the Bible, and then following the directing of the Holy Spirit, right? Because it is a very honorable position and one that really shouldn't be taken lightly, even though there really is very little of what we see in scripture, but it's clearly pointed out for a purpose, right? God has set up his church as he sees fit. And he says, a deacon should be in the church this. And we as a church must always be mindful of what that is, right? And have boldness and have, be discreet and be uh, uh, spirit filled in making the decisions as to who it will be, right? Because in the future, hey, maybe we'll have some more deacon votes, right? Many churches, um, Going back to the traditional side of things, there's so many different ways that people look at deacons. Like I said, some churches believe in deacon boards. Some believe in individually set deacons over specific areas. Uh, some just have deacons who never really even meet together for meetings, but meet one-on-one -on -one with the pastors and they go over specific things. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, how much truly a lot of churches that I'm familiar with, they have three year terms for their deacons, right? So after the three years, um, they will have another group of individuals uh, who will be able to then be voted in to fulfill the role of the deacon, uh, the church's requirement of one year off for the deacon, but then they can be re-voted in at that point. It, it just gives a break, but also opportunity to serve for other individuals. There's a lot that goes in uh, to what churches feel. And really it comes down to as a church body deciding on scripturally, right? And the pastor's uh, uh, guidance through scripture, what a deacon is and should be in the church. So last week, church members, this week, deacons. Next week, we'll look at the pastor and then um, We'll continue on from there. Let's pray and then we'll take some prayer requests tonight. Lord, thank you so much. Uh, as we approach these topics, Lord, just kind of overview of what the church is made up of. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, the church is uh, a called out group of individuals, saved people who come together to glorify you with their lives, with their praise, with their worship. Lord, uh, everything from finances to servanthood. Lord, and I just pray that as we look to scriptures, we understand that you have established offices in the church, these two offices of pastors and deacons, but also how important the role of a church member truly is. Lord, be with this time of prayer request. We ask it now in Jesus' name, amen.